Welcome to Impact Factor, your weekly dose of commentary on a new medical study. I'm Dr. F. Perry Wilson, coming at you once again from isolation. Please excuse the webcam. Coronavirus has caused us to reevaluate so many things. I'm doing renal consults today from my office, only physically going to see patients if absolutely necessary. This is something that would have been unthinkable to me just a few weeks ago. It's also causing us to reevaluate what we mean by evidence-based medicine. In the days before the pandemic, many of us were of the randomized trial or bust mindset, often dismissing good observational studies without rigorous review, and likewise embracing suspect studies because they happen to be randomized. But with the coronavirus, we don't have the luxury to wait for those big definitive randomized trials. We need to act on the data we have. We need to remember what evidence-based medicine is really all about. It's not just about randomized trials. It's integrating each study into the body of existing data, combining the best available science, reaching defensible conclusions. So I like to read a new study in the context of what I call the pre-study probability of success. In other words, how likely was this drug to work before we got the data from the trial or the study? Let me show you how this works with two recent examples. I'm going to start with the big one. It seems like everyone is talking about this hydroxychloroquine study, which appears in the International Journal of Antimicrobial Agents, and it's generating a lot of press, thanks in no small part to a shout out from Donald Trump. So what is our pre-study probability that hydroxychloroquine would be effective for COVID-19? There's actually a good amount of literature there. Hydroxychloroquine has a long history as an antibiotic and an antiviral drug, and encouragingly seems to inhibit coronavirus replication in vitro. It also changes the structure of the receptor that coronavirus binds to. So I don't know, I'd put the pre-study probability at around 50-50 for hydroxychloroquine. Feel free to disagree. Now let's look at the actual study. 36 patients in France with COVID-19 were examined. 20 of them got hydroxychloroquine and 16 were controls, but this was not randomized. Treated patients were different from those not receiving treatment. The researchers looked at viral clearance over time in the two groups and found what you see here. This appears to be a dramatic reduction in coronavirus carriage in those treated with hydroxychloroquine. Awesome, right? Sure, not randomized, but when we need to make decisions fast, the perfect may be the enemy of the good. Does this study increase my 50-50 prediction that hydroxychloroquine could help? Well, with data coming at us so fast, we have to be careful. There is a huge fly in the ointment in this study that seems to have been broadly overlooked or at least underplayed. There was differential loss to follow-up in the two arms of this study. Viral positivity was not available for six patients in the treatment group, none in the control group. Why unavailable? I made this table to show you. Three transferred to the ICU, one died, and the other two stopped their treatment. By the way, none of the patients in the control group died or went to the ICU. So had these six patients not been dropped, the story we might be telling is that, huh, hydroxychloroquine might increase the rate of death in ICU transfer in COVID-19. Okay, before reading this study, I was 50-50 on hydroxychloroquine. After, yeah, I'm right where I started. Because of the problems with this study design, not just its observational nature, but that differential loss to follow up, the data from the French study doesn't move the needle for me at all. It doesn't mean hydroxychloroquine failed. What we have to decide now is whether 50-50 is good enough to try. Given the relatively good safety profile of hydroxychloroquine and the dire situation we find ourselves in, it may be very reasonable to use this drug, even despite the study. Tweets like this, though, aren't helpful. They misrepresent the data, which is equivocal at best. Further, they may encourage people to think we've solved this and stop their social distancing. There are already reports of these medicines being hoarded, now, the key to evidence-based medicine during this epidemic is being transparent about what we know and what we don't. If we want to use hydroxychloroquine, that is a reasonable choice, but we need to tell the public the truth. We're not too sure it will work, and it may even be harmful. Now, the second example I want to share is this one, a randomized trial evaluating lopinavir ritonavir for adults with severe COVID-19. And before I read this trial, did I think lopinavir would work for COVID-19? 
Well, for a nephrologist like me, this requires a bit of reading. But there were some studies showing the drug inhibited viral replication in vitro, and some data suggested it may have had some effect during the original SARS epidemic. But overall, I pegged the pre-study probability fairly low. Let's give it 10%. Now, experts can differ with me on this. I won't be offended. That said, this was a nice randomized trial in 199 people with confirmed COVID-2 infection. The 28-day mortality was 19.2% in the intervention group, 25% in the placebo group. That seems good, but it wasn't statistically significant. The p-value was 0.032. In ordinary days, we'd call this non-significant and move on. Indeed, the authors of the manuscript write, quote, no observed benefit was observed with lopinavir ritonavir treatment beyond the standard of care. These are not ordinary days, though, and Twitter was quick to note that the 5.8% reduction in 20-day mortality seems pretty darn good right now. So shall we be slavishly beholden to statistical significance, even in this time of crisis? The truth is we don't have to compromise our principles here. One nice feature of a randomized trial is that we can use the observed p-value with some minor mathematical jiggerings as a measure of the strength of evidence that lopinavir is effective. This is Bayesianism, and it may be just what we need right now. Instead of dogmatically looking for a p-value below some threshold, we use the evidence in a given trial to lend support to a hypothesis, which depends on our pretrial probability that the drug would be effective. Here's a graph showing the probability that a drug is effective after a trial with reporting a p-value of 0.05 as a function of the pretrial probability of effect. If you were 50-50 before, before the trial, after the trial, you'd be up around 75%. Maybe that's enough to start treating patients. If the trial had a really significant p-value of like 0 0.0001, the curve looks like this. If you were 50-50 before that trial, after the trial, you're almost certain the drug works. So what about lopinavir or ritonavir with its p-value of 0 0.032? Well, it barely moves the needle at all. If you were 90% sure the drug would work before the study was out, these data are entirely consistent with that. If you were 10% sure, like me, the data support that as well. In other words, this trial should not affect our enthusiasm for this drug. It should really not change much of anything. See, we can use these techniques to help us make sense of the rapid fire pace of medical research coming at us. Moreover, we can use the post-trial probabilities uh, of a drug as the pre-trial uh, probability of success of the, the drug in the next study, allowing us to ratchet up the probability curve with successive trials showing signals, even if none of them are statistically significant by classical definitions. As more data comes in, we revise those estimates of efficacy iteratively and transparently. The bottom line is that we don't need to abandon our evidence-based medicine in the face of a pandemic. We need to embrace it now more than ever. And in that embrace, we need to realize what we've known all along. EBM is not just about randomized trials. It's about appreciating the strengths and weaknesses of all data and allowing the data to inch us closer and closer towards truth. For Medscape, I'm Perry Wilson.